I greet you once more. Following, completing the topic that we began some time ago. The topic began with an exploration of what it is to live, to seemingly die only to live again. And without knowing it, we have already then explored not only that concept, but all of the processes and considerations that the entity, the being, the soul, its family continues to move into from there. We have come almost full circle now, almost, but there is yet still a bit to go. For now that we know that there is no death and that all things live and are always living, exploring, expanding in dimensional ways, sentient ways, based upon frequency, planes and dimensions, there is a point at which the soul finds itself once again in the limited space of a physical body, perhaps on a world such as the earth, perhaps elsewhere. How does that happen? And why does that happen? How often do I hear you say, oh, this is surely my last time upon the earth. This is my last go-round, you know. I'm about to hop off, to pop off this wheel of birth and rebirth. Off the karmic wheel. I have been told again and again it's my last lifetime on earth, you know. I'm ascending from this dimension or from this space, never to be back again. I have also heard it is my first lifetime upon the earth. Don't really know what I'm knowing yet. Don't know my way around this part of the neighborhood yet. Does my inexperience show? Shall I tuck it in my pocket? And how does the being that I speak with have so many different thoughts or ideas about itself or about its soul? How is it that you come to think it is your last lifetime or your first? How is it that you think that you have had more than 400 or less than 10? And how is it that your personality comes to know what it comes to know? Are you certain when someone says that this is your last lifetime or do you just hope and prefer that to be the truth? And how can you find out for certain? Perhaps these are some of the questions that we can answer in our time together here. To begin with, why would the soul want to come back to the earth? Such an awful place, isn't it? It is beautiful and majestic in the physical. Nature itself has its majesty to offer to you. How beautiful are the starry nights, the sunny days. How beautiful the minerals and the mammals. But, oh, life on earth is rather difficult and can be, particularly in the third dimension. Why would a soul want to trap itself into a physical body? from where it must offer itself from there, from where it would forget the mystery and the majesty of where it has come from, of having felt and been almost unlimited. What about all of the memories of all of the lifetimes? Why would the soul wish to pass by the so-called valley of forgetfulness to forget the beauty, the wonder, the relationships all that is perfect of the spiritual dimension to limit itself again to be absent most of the time to need to eat and relieve itself and sleep and relearn all over again to doubt and fear and sometimes suffer or succumb to life and what life asks or demands, to work, to toil for a living, to count its dollars and cents, to meet its obligations. Why, oh why, would the soul do this, ask this, 
particularly from the unlimited perspective that it comes from. After all, one could say, it is one thing for those that don't know any better. Well, he didn't know any better, did he? But the soul, with its infinite awareness, with its vision, with its purpose, with its knowingness, after having assimilated all those lifetimes and learned from them, why, again, would it choose to come to the earth? Well, in essence, as with all of the subject that we have explored, it is a semi-automatic thing. The soul does not truly wake up one day and say, you know, it has been quite some years since we have visited the earth. Why don't we pop round there sometime and see if we can pick up a body on the way? It is not quite like that. There are a few different ways in which the soul approaches life on earth. That is the better way to put it. There is an approach to it. After the soul has been out of body for some time, and there are experiences and exceptions to this that we will explore shortly, after the soul has been away from embodiment for some time and has experienced and expressed itself in its density and its frequency in a variety of different ways, it is drawn to one world or another based upon a certain sweetness, a certain fragrance, a certain longing, a capacity that wishes to be of service in some way. A distant memory comes about and the soul explores that memory and then it comes together with other companion souls and explores it from other perspectives. And though we will not call it a longing for the earth, in that moment there is a deep understanding of what life on earth is, how its purpose unfolds, what great and greater purposes it serves. It serves the many, it serves the one. It is a teacher, it is a school, it is a library, it is an event, it is an unfolding, it is evolution. It is consciousness and unconsciousness. It is well-being and discovery. It is the limitless within the limited. It is the will testing itself, proving itself, uncovering itself, decoding itself. And there is a certain grandeur to it. In some ways, the soul might look upon the third dimensional earth a little bit as what you might look at safari, climbing Mount Everest, the impossible that can somehow be conquered. And if someone could be of service to you in the meantime or of service to others, so much the better. And so while you could not completely call it a longing, a strong desire to be there. There is something larger than life itself that is compelling. Something that calls like an echo from long ago. It can be denied for a while, you know. You can push it away and say, no, yes, I have excellent thoughts. Yes, certainly there are experiences that one day I would wish to relive there, but no, not yet. And so the soul can look away, place itself elsewhere, explore others, even other lifetimes elsewhere. But eventually it will be drawn again as one is drawn to the light. You see, the light is simply the light that is within. It is an inner light. It is not always what you would think of as a higher light. It is an inner light. It is a greater truth. And the soul will seek that regardless of where it is. The soul does not say, well, that looks a little bit harder to do. So I think I won't. Or I'll take it, but I'll take the easier version of that. Remember, the soul does not think in terms of polarity. 
And so, in some ways, the soul begins to adjust itself. And again, while you would not entirely call it a desire, the soul begins to feel itself drawn near the earth, nearer the earth. It is not an automatic thing that plucks you and says, there you go, back into an earth body. It draws you to the earth, nearer to the earth. Sometimes, as a soul, you may find yourself being of deeper and greater service in a variety of ways, not simply as a guide to other humans, though this is certainly common. You may find yourself assisting one kingdom or another. You might find a deep resonance with the mineral kingdom and somehow adjust the frequencies of that mineral, fine-tuning it in some way, which also fine-tunes your own frequency. You might find that you are drawn to the animal kingdom and there to watching one species emerge while another withdraws. There is a majesty to this, a perfection to this. More of the time from the human aspect, you only see the extinction of one being. And there you see only how awful that might be. You do not see the perfection by which one withdraws and another emerges, by which one door closes and the next comes forward. And so instead you see only that which you wish to see, but the soul does not. The soul sees so much more than that. So the soul is drawn to the earth and as it is, it continues to fulfill experiences, answer questions. And as it is drawn near to the earth plane, other aspects of soul, other soul family members, other dimensions of soul also begin to draw near. They begin to arrange themselves in ways that are of benefit to the soul. And memories of other lifetimes begin to draw near as well. They begin to be more prominent. Memories of other souls, other experiences, the beauty of other lifetimes, the purpose of other lifetimes, all of these begin to come forward. And as they do, that is when a longing returns. Now in this moment, the longing does not include any form of suffering, or even a purpose, or even a lifetime yet, not anything specific only a gathering around something, energy gathering around something in a very beautiful way, as if a seed had been planted, and only that which can nurture the seed comes near, just the right kind of soil, just the right minerals for it to absorb, just the right amount of sunlight. And so the soul begins to bathe in all of this, nearer and nearer to the density and the dimension of the earth plane. Now there is always a match to this. So it is not that the soul is all of a sudden just caught in the gravitational field of the earth so that it is there stuck in a lifetime on the earth. No, remember all things are by planes and frequencies of expression. And so as much as all that the soul has arranged for itself and drawn to itself, learned for itself and experienced, all of this becomes available in the moment. And it becomes a kind of a garment, a kind of garment of light, a creative garment of light. Multitudes of colors, waves and emanations of light, and the soul is dressing itself layer by layer. I tell you, this is a very beautiful process and has very little to do with being thrust into a lifetime or dumped in a basket here upon the earth. And so the soul 
remains there for a time, dressing itself in thoughts, creative thoughts, experiences, aligning itself, and slowly, most of the time, slowly, there is a desire that is born that becomes more creative, more important and imperative that is greater than others. And it does not automatically say, oh, I wish to have a lifetime on earth. No. The desire is for the fulfillment of an experience. The desire is for a depth of knowing. It is a research. It is a fulfillment. It is a craving. It is a companionship. The soul sees not the limitless of earth in that moment. It sees that which is limitless. It sees all that is possible in the earth plane. It sees how the will, the true and divine and free will, can overcome limitation. It begins to see it as an experiment, as a project, as a desire. And then there is, for some, a yearning, a true yearning to return to the earth for this purpose. And for others, it is not such a yearning or such a desire. It would feel a little bit more like less than a need. Something that, oh well, yes, it is worth accomplishing. Something that is worthwhile. Now again, remember that the soul is not caught up in time and calendars. And so to the soul, a lifetime upon the earth can be experienced in a little bit more than the blink of an eye. So there is no reason why the soul would say, oh no, not that again, not for something that goes by that quickly as it were. Later, in the density of the moment, the human being marking the days would think differently about its life. It's 50 or 80 or 100 or 200 years it will live or what it will be. It will think differently about it then without the vision and the perspective that the soul has. But the soul says, why not? It's a fine adventure and it is worth having. And so once that decision is arrived at, and again I tell you, most of the time it is relatively automatic. It is not the mind considering and mulling over the thought and thinking about it for a few months and planning it. It simply begins to reveal itself. Like a thought, the soul begins to create it, to dress itself in that experience. And as it dresses itself with that desire and with the experiences that it wishes to have, the garments become a little bit more fitting, a little bit more dense, and it is not so unlimited. Now there is vision that is being formed. Now there is purpose that is being formed. Now the imagination also begins to conceive of that life. Once the soul begins to conceive the possibility of that life, then on the earth plane there is also a man and a woman that will begin to somehow, consciously or unconsciously, conceive a womb for the soul that will become a babe in the womb. And so the two begin to mesh together. The soul that is being drawn to the earth, the womb that is being prepared for that soul to become a human experience. It is almost automatic. From your perspective, the two could seem so very unrelated. A man and a woman who barely know each other come together in a sexual encounter by which there is a conception that takes place, never planned, and yet that becomes the perfect vehicle for a soul that wishes to have a lifetime upon the earth, or a man and a woman unable to conceive for years, 
by one means or another with the use of technology and the medical arts, or by a kiss of nature herself, conceive of a child which then prepares the womb, which is perfect again for the soul. And so these moments are orchestrated by the grade and greatness perfection that takes place in every world, in every expression, in every dimension. And it is no different here upon the earth. And so now that the womb is being made ready, a form of conception takes place because the idea, the thought that has given life to the desire, already there is the concept of life. Conception has now taken place. Now, the being, the soul, begins to know that a life is being prepared for it upon the earth and it begins to fine-tune that garment of light that is now close enough to the earth to be made of earth-like material, earth-like filaments or fibers of light. Now they are not only life itself, now it is earth life, now it has earth purpose, now it has dimension and awareness, now it is destined to be a life. And so the soul dresses itself in that. And now, if you will recall some of our earlier discussions in which we said that the soul stored every moment, every miracle, every memory, every joy, every debt, every desire, and matches them lifetime by lifetime, now the soul begins to draw upon itself and to call upon all of those memory, all those bits of Akash light and all the ones that can be experienced in this life, all that the soul would wish to bring forward based upon its own knowing and the wisdom that is nature and natural all that is associated with the soul's yearning, all of the questions that are unanswered, the experiences that were incomplete, the desires that want to be manifest, it begins to come forward and lodge itself into a wave of desire. Now the soul is creating something. It is creating the entity, it is creating the beingness. Recall in some of our earlier discussions that the being, you, became not separate from the soul, but connected in a different way so that the entity, the being itself, had its own purpose, had its own awareness, that later, when this was all merged together into the soul, and so, now it is returned again to the entity that is being created. And so a purpose comes forward. What does the soul want to bring together? Whom does it want to associate with? What experiences does it wish to have? It becomes a very creative and engaging process. A little bit like a very fine recipe that one continues to add to making it perfect in its taste, customizing it so that no one can be the same as another, aligning itself into a refined truth, calling upon itself to be unique and creative. And the process continues. And so a greater question comes about that the soul, as the entity now again, wishes to answer or experience. That becomes the greater purpose. The soul recognizes all of the archetypes that are available to choose from upon the earth, and there are many. For each particular age is dressed with several different archetypes, as many as 44 and more at times. 
And so the soul begins to dress itself out of a combination of the finest archetypes, placing these within the architecture of the human body that it will occupy. And then, like a very caring and loving parent, it begins to surround that entity with love, with compassion, with learning, with memories, with all of the memories that will assist it in drawing to itself the finest quality lifetime that it can. It gives the entity a kind of education. It places within its cellular memory all that would be of finest assistance. Those debts that it wished to pay, tucked in here. Those promises that it wanted to make certain to know, somewhere else. Something that said you will want to visit here or go there, that goes elsewhere. And all of this becomes a part of the entity. It is all placed and displayed there perfectly. Anything that will be of benefit to that entity becomes part of that very fine package. Now you may well wonder at this time, then how is it to be that such a fine soul with such a very fine plan would take all of that and place it into an entity that may then be born into a body that is ill or that can contract a certain dis-ease that may be maimed in some way whose life might be terminated soon whose terminal illness might be difficult or any other imagining that you may draw to yourself now. Well, here I tell you that there is no exception to what the soul considers perfect. The soul does not see a human body or a human life as less than perfect, at least where its desire is concerned at least in how it chooses to experience itself. It does not necessarily say, oh, very well, any old body will do any lifetime as long as I get one. It takes that which it is drawn to and knows that in its own way perfection has brought it together. The soul is aware of what kind of body the entity, the beingness will occupy. The soul is aware that a blink of an eye might be a quicker blink of an eye. But it does not value these as more or less than an experience. It does not value this to say it will be quicker so it is not worth it. It will be more difficult so it is not worth it. It is a terminal illness. It will be over too soon. I'd like an easier one. Not like that. Later, this may come about, but not in that moment. And so the soul organizes everything to its most perfect ability. The question has been put, how much does the soul plan for? How much does the soul know? Does it know who the parents will be? Does it know what occupation it may have? Does it know who the siblings will be? Does it know how long it will live in human terms? This answer is relative and it depends according to the soul. The soul can know as much as it wants to know. Remember that to the soul this is somewhat of an adventure. So the soul has free will in how it organizes itself, how it has dressed itself. But it does not always know or want to know, nor would it be important to know all of the smallest details of life. It is rarely important to the soul whether it is a blonde or a brunette. It is only important to the soul whether the skin color, for instance, is lighter or darker, unless it has also come to explore a prejudice. For instance, if that be part of what the soul's makeup is, then it may be important to know this. 
but if that will not be the case, then that would not matter. If the soul's purpose or directive involves many others that it has known at the soul level, then it will make certain that these light filaments are exchanged one to the other. It's a little bit like a promise ring. You would recognize another somehow, in some way. You would recognize the filaments of light within the others so that regardless of what their appearance is, or whether they were born before or after you, you would recognize the importance of these beings and sometimes in what way they might relate to you. Sometimes only there is a recognition, a soul's recognition, and no memory whatsoever of what the reason for coming together is. After all, one may owe a debt to the other, and that must be paid simply and truly in that lifetime. You would not awaken one day and say, you know, a few hundred years ago I owed you a sixpence, and here it is. And so, returning... The soul dresses itself conspicuously in all that will serve it in this lifetime, and then it directs its light to do the rest. To say it directs its light is a little bit to say that it is directed by the will. So the soul is not exactly like a chef taking a pinch of this or a pinch of that. It begins to fine-tune the frequency the frequency then, the wisdom of its own making, begins to draw everything else to itself. The frequency and the plane of expression begins to draw to itself just the right qualities of light so that every experience that the individual energy entity will have will in some way relate to the soul. Every breath relates to the soul and is purposeful. That being said, not every single action that the entity takes during that life is so very important. For instance, you may open the window one day to let in fresh air. Is that important to the soul? No, not particularly. You may oversleep till noon one day because you had a particularly fine dream. Is that dream of great importance to the soul, not necessarily. You may meet and fall in love with a certain individual who then turns out to be not completely right for you and it is a short-lived love. Is that of interest to the soul? Yes, but only in so far as it is in some way related to the filaments of light that it dressed itself in. You see, the soul welcomes all experiences and all expressions, particularly those that are original, natural, and creative. But it does not mean that every single one of these is related to the purpose. However, every breath that the energy of the entity draws is in some way related to the life, to the soul, and important to the life. So now the soul has come that much closer, that much closer to the earth, to the concept of its life, and to its conception. Now, when does it come even closer? When does it enter the body? And what do you call birth? A very important question for those who consider it from the earth plane. Again, Here you have a uniqueness. Sometimes the soul is able to monitor the energy of the entity and the vehicle for to the soul that is what it is, the vehicle of expression that that energy or entity will enter. It is able to monitor it from quite afar. And it is truly not so interested in a vehicle that is being built for it, for that is what is truly taking place. If you ordered a vehicle specially and to order, here and there you would check on its progress, making sure that it was being made to your specifications. But for the most part, you would say, please alert me as soon as it is ready, and I'll come round to fetch it. So it is the same with the body. The soul is interested in its progress. 
interested in what it will occupy, but not drawn by the day, the hour, and the calendar until that becomes important. The soul does not measure and click the clock until it becomes important for the being, until it becomes time for the insertion of that great light into the great body that is being prepared. Then there are souls that make another choice. As you might imagine, there are those that wish to be part of every moment, of every decision, to feel everything. I wish to know it, feel it, experience it, draw upon it. I wish every part of it to be in my memory. And so there are such souls as place themselves so near, so near, so near to the vehicle, the body that is being created as if it is almost entering it already. Now to be clear, and perhaps to answer the question for some, the entity cannot truly embody in soul, enter that body until it is fully prepared to draw a breath. It can associate itself to the life. It can claim it and say, that is my body, for no other will come near it, for that is already known. But it is not considered a lifetime that belongs to that soul until that vehicle is prepared to draw a breath, the breath of life, a human breath of life. Then there is the full merging. Perhaps that answers the question again. It cannot be answered completely. In times to come, when humanity has known its awareness and its consciousness a little bit more, when it is a little bit more aware of the being and the soul that has associated itself with its future life, it will also be able to know when did life begin for that energy. It will know the moment of conception, the moment of the concept of the soul that will come and be able to associate many different ways in which time has birthed itself or the lifetime has truly begun. At a certain point, there is no denying any longer, and the soul is drawn and drawn and drawn closer and closer and closer to the earth and to that body. Now, here is an interesting time to pause, because we could say that the soul does have a moment out of time in which something not a thought, not a doubt of how things will go, but some unknown, unnamed thing may say, not now, not now. And it will not necessarily say, not now because this or that, not now because you will not be able to realize your purpose, not now because the love of your life also said, not now. It is simply a moment out of time. And it is possible that the soul will withdraw in that moment. There are many different possibilities, yearnings or reasons for this, but I tell you there is perfection in it, for the soul knows only that which is perfect and the recognition. Something within the frequency will say, not now. All of this takes place out of time, or so it cannot necessarily be recognized by human time. During that moment, another soul may say, it is now. And another soul may claim, not steal, claim that body or that moment or that lifetime. In that case, there is the knowledge and the approval of those that have conceived the womb and created the vehicle. This is not done without knowing. There is no theft here of a body or of a lifetime. There is no usurping someone's purpose. And yet, there are a myriad different souls that would say, I have a lot that I can learn. 
It may not have been exactly as I would have designed a life, but it has been designed, it is purposeful, and it is close enough to being perfect to what would be entirely suitable for me. And so the one soul that would have been certain that it was being drawn to the earth does not, and another fulfills that purpose. Remember that there is only life and living and that all of life and living is purposeful in one way or another. The mystery of life always persists. To the soul that did not choose that physical body, it may choose another, or the not now may begin to reveal itself in a different way in which calls for another experience altogether. It is always perfect, however. It is also possible that that moment of not now releases the womb, and the womb itself is released if that vehicle, the body, the babe, is created and a soul's energy entity frequency is not there to embody it, then that child may very well be stillborn. There you have an experience or a reason why this may come about on the earth plane. Likewise, it may be that this not now happens early enough and the child may be aborted naturally or artificially for one reason or another that does not serve the whole. The whole must be served and always is. And so you see, life is not simply abandoned. It is because life, the greater aspects of life, are always served that sometimes a vehicle of body may be ensouled and sometimes it is not. It serves a greater purpose, though it would not always seem so upon the earth. Those souls that wish to know experiences upon the earth will do so. And it cannot necessarily be avoided. You might say to yourself now, I know with certainty that I am done with the earth. I bid it goodbye adieu not to return. And you may say that with certainty now, and later it may change. But you see, there are many different ways in which one is drawn to the earth. There are, for example, karmic lifetimes and lifetimes by choice. There are lifetimes upon lifetimes that are part of the wheel of birth and rebirth. And there are those in which a master may insert himself into a life, into a body that serves a greater time period, a blink of an eye upon the earth. So I dare say to you, take the time, take the trouble to say to yourself, my soul always knows best and I will always follow its inclination to what time or space or dimension or destiny and density I am called to that I will live to the fullness of my being now and today, tomorrow and the next and be at the next lifetime that I exchange as well. That way you will always be in the highest and the best place that you can be. A body is a vehicle of light Sometimes it is given over or exchanged with what you might term an ascended master. An ascended master is one that has lived sufficient lives and lifetimes and experiences on many different planes and expressions of consciousness so that it is they and not the body or time or space that arranges or rearranges them. They have become master 
of the density and the destiny, merging the two of these together in a perfection, in a spiral's light dance. These teachers belong to all. They do not truly belong to the earth or to a certain dimension or to a certain being. They are associated with certain truths, with certain teachings, with certain subjects or archetypes or time periods. But these are only by associations. They are not formal truths. And so at times, a being such as this may claim a body for a time only to set it down. Or I tell you that these beings can easily assimilate a body constructed out of earth material. In essence, they are constructing a vehicle made of light parameters, organizing it according to the laws and ordinations of the world in which they are manifest in, and thereby they claim the light of that body or that being or that time without being entrenched in it. So it is a light body. It is made of light material. A light body is one that does not have all of the trappings of memories associated with it. A light body is one that is created for a limited purpose or a limited time in order to serve others, not necessarily to serve itself. So an ascended master being a teacher for a time, a teacher for a people, a teacher for a transition. It is a purposeful gathering of awareness of light. And one would not become trapped in that dimension, that gravitational field, or that density by claiming such a body. It would be assimilated, assembled, and then disassembled when its need is no longer. So here you have another example of soul's light drawn to the earth, but not necessarily begun its life as a babe or completed it as an ancient of days. The soul will claim a body, will begin a purpose, and will live it fully and completely, regardless of how long that life is. The soul does not measure a complete lifetime as one that begins in some babe and ends high into old age. The soul does not stay if you live to 100 instead of 70 that it did a better job of life. Everything that the soul measures is based upon experiences. The full measure of experiences, understandings, directives, compassions in all of the ways that the being is self, selfless, self-full or even selfish all of these are complete experiences and the soul takes delight in these and so it matters not again the length of time how much does the soul know about its previous lifetimes when it comes as close to the earth as that? Ah, and here again it depends. The more consciousness that one has accumulated in all of the lives and the more purpose there is associated with such knowing, the more that it will know and the more that the memories will contain. If it is not as purposeful for the being to remember all such, then the valley of forgetfulness will be more dense, it will be more thick. It's a little bit like coating the memories with something that is thicker, so that it simply becomes more difficult to penetrate them. If there is enough desire, enough will, it will be penetrated. Now, once the individual life begins... How much of that life belongs to the soul or to that entity, energy, beingness that the soul has created? Here I tell you that it is a shared example. The soul and the entity share 
responsibility and care for the body. They both take care in giving to it adequate rest so that the vehicle will be as strong, as light, and as resilient as possible. And so the soul cares for the expansion of ideas and creativities, placing within the being creative desires. I want, I desire, I would seek, I would like to fulfill, one day I would like to. It places within it concepts to explore, to discover, questions that need to be answered, and in lieu of these problems that must be solved. Why is it that some are born with many more problems than others? It is by the orchestration of the soul, and this can be mitigated, it can be transmuted. The more cooperation and communion a being has with its soul, it can begin to rearrange this, because the energy, the entity, being highly attuned and highly aligned with its soul when it remembers that it can do this, it can begin to direct more of its life. And so there are those that go about and say, well, it was my soul's will, I had nothing to do with it. It is God's will, I had nothing to do with it. I am simply being moved and taken to where I am taken to. I have no choice in the matter. Well, certainly that is one way to think about it. Of course, there are others that would then say, I am control of it all. There is no such thing as God, and if I have a soul, then one day I may know of it. But right now and today, there is only me. And if there are any others, it is myself and I. And we are making the best of it. So there is another example of a thought process. And of course, the third is that which toggles between consciousness and unconscious. I know, but I yet seek. I understand, but I seek to know even more. I have opened the door somewhat, a crack, and now I seek further. So there are those that invite guidance and seek further knowledge. And so the communion becomes one of the self and the soul, one that involves will, free will, and divine will. These are the lifetimes that in some ways are the most successful because these are waters that can be navigable. It can be discovered, it can be explored. Does it mean that every answer will be forthright and clear? No, but the pathways are open. Here is one path, there is another. So the journey once undertaken is one that becomes more clear and more concise. And so a life becomes a full life. Sometimes a soul animates more than one lifetime at once. Sometimes a soul can choose to animate several different lifetimes at once. And these can be born at many different occasions. It is not difficult. It is not that the soul must manipulate like a puppet all of the different lifetimes for each one is free and have already been given all that could possibly be needed. However, the soul is available to offer memories, experiences, direction, assistance. And so it is a very engaging, in-depth exploration for the soul to animate and engage in all of the different lifetimes. More of the time the soul pays more attention to the lifetime that is more conscious because the soul's experience is to take delight in the exploration of creative consciousness. So the more creative the lifetime, the more conscious the being, the more interaction the soul will have in it. But there is not necessarily more love. It is not that the soul will love one entity that it has created more than another. This is unequivocal. It is a different kind of love. It is not an earthly love that can be given or taken away. 
It is a consistent flow that is given in emanations of light. The soul continues always to relate to the different lifetimes. Sometimes, rarely, it will connect the different lifetimes together and sometimes they will recognize themselves as part of the same family. This is rare, I tell you, but it is possible. And so now we have explored perhaps a full cycle. It is thought that we have answered more questions than not relative to these topics. And yet many hundreds if not thousands of your questions may go unanswered. And yet we have explored on living and dying and living again from the perspective of the soul and the being and the entity from the physical life and the transition to non-physical, to in-between lives until the desire that comes to rest and draw one to the physical life again. We have followed a cycle all of the way through consistently. I give gratitude for your indulgence for having explored such a topic in depth as we have. always in deepest and fondest pleasure. I extend to you my grateful gratitude for your sharing these journeys with me. Until the next moment, sweet ones, this moment is complete.